So we've now seen quite a bit about eigenvectors and eigenvalues and I want to take some time to show you why we've bothered with all this. So the first application is to differential equations. So specifically we're going to look at differential equations of the following form. So x and y are going to be functions of t. t is some parameter you can think of as time and the equations are going to be things of the form x dot dot means time derivative equals ax plus by and y dot equals cx plus dy so yeah if you don't know this notation x dot means dx by dt it's just shorthand so here a b c and d are constants they don't depend on t so this is a pair of coupled ordinary differential equations. Coupled means that you know x and y are in both formulae, right? So both of these equations involve x and y. So our goal is to kind of decouple them and turn them into an equation for two separate quantities that only involve one at a time. So the idea will be first introduce a vector v which depends on time. This is going to be x of t, y of t and its derivative is going to be x dot y dot, another vector. Um, and now this equation we can write as v dot equals a v where a is this matrix A, B, C, D of constants. So A has no time dependence, A is just a constant matrix. So these two systems of equations are the same. So here's the idea. Let lambda 1 and lambda 2 be the eigenvalues of A and assume that they're distinct, that they're not the same and let u1 and u2 be the eigenvectors. Write v as alpha times u1 plus beta times u2. So here alpha and beta are going to be the components of v when I expand it with respect to these two vectors u1 and u2. So maybe this is u1, u2. So I'm saying what is the u1 component of v and what's the u2 component of v. This is no different from saying um, you know, v is x times 1, 0 plus y times 0, 1. So if u1, u2 were 1, 0 and 0, 1, alpha would be x and, and beta would be y. So alpha and beta are the components of V in the eigendirections. We'll see somehow what this means in an example later. And the nice thing now is that if we write what this equation means, this equation, in these components, it's going to decouple into two equations one involving alpha and one involving beta and no mixing between them. So now v dot is well we get an alpha dot u1 and a beta dot u2 and you think okay Leibniz rule I should also be differentiating u1 u2 but u1 u2 are just the eigenvectors of this constant matrix A they don't have to depend on time they're just constants So there's no u1 dot or u2 dot terms. And this is supposed to be equal to a v. When I apply a to alpha 1 u1, I get alpha, sorry, alpha u1, I get alpha a u1, and I'm going to get a beta a u2. And because u1 is an eigenvector, this is going to be alpha lambda 1 u1, and this is going to be beta lambda 2 u2. 
So now just taking components, the U1 component is going to be alpha dot on the left hand side, that's the coefficient of U1 on the left hand side, and on the right hand side it's going to be alpha lambda 1. That's the coefficient of u1 on the right hand side. The u2 component on the left is going to be beta dot and on the right is going to be beta lambda 2. So this is just like taking the x and the y components you get two separate equations except instead of taking them in the 1 0 and 0 1 directions I'm taking them in the u1 u2 directions. So the punchline is these two equations are equivalent to the first two equations but the first one only involves alpha and the second one only involves beta so these are now decoupled and this worked precisely because we have this pair of eigenvectors that we could use to uh, decompose our vector so let's see how this works in practice in an example. Um, I want to take um, this system of equations x dot equals y and y dot equals minus x and the reason I want to take this pair is um, it's equivalent to a, another system so um, if you differentiate this first equation again you get x double dot equals y dot and y dot is minus x so this is equal to minus x so this is maybe a familiar second order differential equation x double dot equals minus x it's called a simple harmonic oscillator it governs simple harmonic motion um, so in general if you have a second order equation like this you can define y to be x dot and now that's one equation the second equation y dot equals x double dot equals whatever x double dot equals that's going to allow you to convert a second order equation into a pair of first order equations like this that's quite a useful trick um, so that's it's it's an equation that describes things like a particle on a spring where the other end of the spring is fixed and the length of the spring is x so then like the mass of the particle times its acceleration x double dot is supposed to be the force and the force on this particle is proportional to x so it's k times x and it points in the minus x direction towards the origin so this is like Newton's law and Hooke's law tell you this equation and then if m equals k equals 1 you recover this um, x double dot equals minus x just just so there's not a load of k's and m sitting everywhere um, so how are we going to solve this equation well what's our matrix a a is 0 1 minus 1 0 and what are its eigenvalues well its characteristic polynomial is det of minus t 1 minus 1 minus t which is t squared plus 1 so its eigenvalues are lambda 1 equals i and lambda 2 equals minus i the two square roots of minus 1 what are its eigenvectors well for lambda 1 we get uh, 0 1 minus 1 0 times x y equals i x i y that's the equation for the eigenvectors we can solve that equation um, the first component tells us x, uh, y equals i x the second component tells us minus x equals i y which is equivalent to the first so we could take something like 1i with uh, lambda 2 equals minus i um, I think
think we end up with uh, 1 minus i. So this is the vector I'm going to call u1, and this is the vector I'm going to call u2. Remember, in general, your eigenvector is going to have a free variable in it, but we just want to pick a particular eigenvector. So what do we do? We write xy in the form alpha u1 plus beta u2. In other words, alpha times 1i plus beta times 1 minus i. So what are alpha and beta, right? They're supposed to be the components of v in these two directions. What does that really mean? Well, if we multiply this whole thing out, we get alpha plus beta in the first component and alpha i minus beta i in the second component. So actually alpha plus beta equals x and i alpha minus beta equals y. So alpha is going to be uh, x plus y, uh, let's say minus i y over 2. All right, if I do x minus i y, I'm going to get alpha plus beta plus alpha minus beta. So that's 2 alpha, and I have to divide by 2 to get alpha. And similarly, beta is x plus i y over 2. I'm going to get alpha minus alpha because of these i's, and then beta plus beta again because of the i's. So that's what alpha and beta are supposed to be. So our equation is now alpha dot equals lambda 1 alpha and beta dot equals lambda 2 beta. Well, lambda 1 is i, so we get alpha 1 equal, sorry, alpha 1 dot equals i alpha and beta, sorry, there's no, there's no 1 there, is it? It's just alpha dot equals i alpha and beta dot equals minus i beta. So if you divide by alpha, you get uh, alpha dot over alpha, which is d by dt of log alpha. And that's supposed to be equal to i, which tells you log alpha equals i t plus a constant, which tells you alpha equals some constant times e to the i t. The second equation is going to give you the same except with a minus i in the exponent. So some constant times e to the minus i t. So in other words x y is alpha times 1 i, so c 1 e to the i t 1 i plus c 2 e to the minus i t 1 minus i. That is x is c1 e to the i t plus c2 e to the minus i t and y is c1 e to the i t minus c2 e to the i t uh, minus i t all multiplied by i. Okay, so that's the general solution of this equation, this x dot equals y, y dot equals minus x. And you might be perturbed because this is supposed to be describing the motion of a particle on a spring. So x is supposed to be a real number, it's supposed to be this distance here. And there's i's all over the place. And y is supposed to be the velocity again eyes all over the place. So what's going on? Well the thing is C1, C2 can be imaginary or, or complex numbers and in the end all the eyes are gonna disappear and just give us real numbers if we pick the right initial conditions. So let's pick some initial conditions. Let's suppose that at time zero our particle is say a distance one from the origin 
and let's suppose its velocity at time zero, so y at zero, is zero, so that we hold the particle at position one and then let go of it. What does that mean? Well, if um, we substitute t equals zero into this, we get c1 plus c2. And if we substitute t equals zero into this, we get uh, i c1 minus i c2. So the second equation is telling us c1 equals c2, and the first equation is telling us uh, c1 equals a half. So x of t is a half e to the i t plus e to the minus i t, and y of t equals i over 2 e to the i t minus e to the minus i t. So I promised you all the i's would go away, and they're still there, but if you've seen, um, you know, this relationship between trig functions and exponentials, you'll know that this is just an alternative way of writing cos of t. And this is an alternative way of writing minus sine of t. Right, so sine of t is like e to the i t minus e to the minus i t over 2i, and 1 over i is minus i, so that's why there's a minus sign here. And no, now these are re real numbers, right? Cos of t and sine of t are real numbers. Why there's the minus sign here? Well, if you imagine if you take a particle and you let go of it, it's going to move towards the origin, so x is going to be moving in the negative direction. So this is the velocity is directed inwards. Okay, so don't be worried about the fact that there are these eyes everywhere, they're somehow just a computational device, and at the end they all disappear. So the main takeaway from this is you start with what looks like a complicated system of equations. It's got two variables and the variables are kind of mixed up in some way that the derivatives depend on one another. By using the eigenvectors of the matrix A, you separate this into two equations which are completely decoupled, um, namely these equations here. And these are equations you can solve very easily.